Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the St. Louis Angular Lunch for, is it April 2018? Uh, sponsored by Oasis Digital. You can see our logo here. But our, uh, I guess our panel is mostly Oasis Digital, but we have a bunch of people in the audience to participate also. We're going to do a panel about ng-conf. Um, so before we kick off, I just want a show of hands here of who attended ng-conf. So I have four behind me. So we have 13 people in the room who are at ng-conf. So this should have a lot of intensive ng-conf uh, summary going on. Um, so I'm going to moderate a little bit and try not to give too many opinions. So I think the first step is uh, say 30 seconds of words about yourself and then your impressions of the conference. Okay. Hi, I'm Chris Harden. I'm with Oasis Digital. Um, Impressions of the conference. It was kind of a lot of the same stuff, in my opinion. Just um, it was kind of a lot of the old stuff. Just uh, trying to, I guess, make it accessible for everybody, like ArcGIS and then JRX. So I didn't see a lot of like earth-shattering things. Just trying to get like the community up to speed on stuff. Is my impression. Uh, my name is Corey Ryland. Um, I help teach the Angular Bootcamp classes. Um, kind of my summary impression of the conference is uh, kind of what you said, a lot of the same, but uh, more about stability and tooling. Um, platforms really starting to stabilize and the tooling has kind of caught up. So from this point out, Angular can do a lot of really cool things that are going to make it easier to adopt um, in the near future, hopefully. Hello, I'm Paul Spears. Um, aside from just the kind of the content, Kind of the general air is that they're continuing to try and like move the conference into a space of like you know bigger, more entertaining, um, better speakers, better quality of, of speakers and events and, and offering, and they're continuing to just kind of like relentlessly turn the crank on, on improving the quality of the conference as a whole. Uh, in terms of the Angular content itself, I just echo that that was already said. I'm Lance Finney. I'm a developer here at Oasis Digital and with everyone else on the panel, an instructor with Angular Bootcamp. This was my second ng-conf. I also went last year. Uh, a lot of what everyone else has already said. Uh, Angular is maturing, so there wasn't a whole lot that came out that was uh, new and shocking to people. Uh, one of the shocking things that is, was that, I, I suppose, was that Angular 6 did not come out. Uh, they were really working hard to get that out last week, but they just didn't, so that'll be uh, coming out uh, soon. Uh, the one thing that I think did amaze a lot of people was Stack Blitz, just seeing the power of that particular tool. Uh, and the other thing I would add is, like last year, there was a lot of, hey, you're going to get, to, you're going to need to know RxJS um, and maybe NGRX. And this time it was, all right, now that you know that you need to know it, here are some. <coughs> workshops on how to do it, and a whole track on NGRX. So they really were focusing on reactive. OK, so I, I have to take the opportunity before anybody else says it any further. I guess we have to thank uh, Eric and Albert for making Stackblitz, because I think Stackblitz was the after. I think it was literally the star of ng-conf. I think every, like almost every talk mentioned it and or used it. It was just, uh, uh, just amazing. Um, OK, so I guess for a next question from the audience, then we'll kind of go down the row. What's anybody want to know about ng-conf? What's StackBlitz? Who wants to talk about what StackBlitz is? OK. So StackBlitz is an online IDE. And it was purpose built to build and download dependencies and execute your application like five times faster than if you were to do it locally. And it was built in such a way that it automatically understands the shape of an Angular CLI project and it can you know run it right there inside your browser with no local tooling. So it's like zero footprint install, you just go to their website, click I want an Angular project, and about three seconds later your Hello World Angular project's already running in your browser. Um, and they have all kinds of hooks and bells and whistles on top of it that just make it an absolute amazing demo, no matter how you slice and dice it. Uh, it was created by Eric Simons and, Simmons and um, Albert Pye, and they've been doing just an absolute amazing job on just pushing this thing forward in, in quality, visual appeal, and, and tooling for it. And so um, recently, the Angular docs themselves actually moved over so that if you are clicking on an example link in the documentation, it now loads in StackBlitz. 
Um, so you can kind of think of it as a next generation leap and bound ahead of Plunker. So. That's B-L-I-T-Z. And on the first day, they had a five-minute talk, which I think wowed almost everyone, where they loaded up in their laptop on, you know, on the podium a PWA. And then they made a change to it. And, oh, and they gave everyone the URL. One of the things with StackBlitz is it's when you are running it, everyone can also run that same app. So they had something like 800 different devices throughout the hall, and then some people around the world, who were using that app, seeing it live, and then they made changes and they were immediately pushed to everyone's machine. And the wonderful thing is one of the changes they made turned it into a Rickroll. So they Rickrolled 800 people on their own devices all at the same time. But it was very, very impressive what they were able to do and to push these changes. They also showed the ability to uh, look at how it is running on any individual client's machine, and you can debug there. Uh, and for one of their talks, they even selected one of the f you know several hundred people who were there, picked one of them, popped something, an alert up on that person's device, and then when that person raised their hand, they got a free laptop from them. So, you know, like, the really showy way, uh, you know, giving things away is really showy, but, like, just the power of being able to do that from StackBlitz was impressive. So something I find interesting about StackBlitz that's different than, like, Plunker or something is that if you want to add a third-party library, you're not like copying and pasting a script tag to load it from a CDN. You're actually importing it as a node module, but you don't have to worry about all that. Um, Stackless kind of does it for you. So they actually wrote their own uh, package manager that runs in the browser and just kind of does this all on the fly really fast. And then when you want to take your prototype, and export it from StackBlitz and keep going with it, you can just say export, and then it creates your package.json, and everything's set up like you would need it for a production app. You're not having to figure out, okay, now how do I convert these to node modules and do it all correctly? Um, kind of one thing about StackBlitz that I found really impressive is its impact on the Angular community as a whole. Um, just the education resources, the code examples people can put out there are just much higher quality um, with inside the StackBlitz editor. And then also the, the ease of recreating issues. Um, in the past, to recreate some kind of bug to file an issue against Angular or any of its packages was really hard. Uh, but with StackBlitz, you can just simply share a link. And uh, you get a lot more help a lot faster, the turnaround, um, just the impact of the community is really impressive. I promise only one more bit of the Stack Blitz Love Fest, which is at Oasis Digital. We teach a class, Angular Bootcamp, and we use it in class most of the time also. So a non Stack Blitz next <laughs> question for our panel. There were a lot of videos I noticed about uh, NGRX in general. And I was just wondering, like, what is your biggest takeaway of NGRX and where it's going? And what is the best extension or library to use on top of NGRX? Who wants to talk about NGRX? I've got lots of Someone else go first. Yeah, there was an entire track on NGRX. The second of the three days of the conference, they broke into four different rooms, and one room was devoted to NGRX. Um, it was definitely an area of focus. Um, <clears throat> It was also interesting that a lot of the talks were about how to make NGRX cleaner. Uh, the magic word uh, often was boilerplate. Uh, people uh, trying to r simplify how to use uh, NGRX and get rid of boilerplate. In one of the talks by the NGRX guys, like the main uh, leaders of that team, they brought in uh, Ward Bell and John Papa, who have done something called NGRX Data, which is a library that's built on top of it, uh, which is now going to be incorporated into the mainline NGRX. I have not personally really looked at it. It looks interesting from what I saw in a presentation, but I haven't looked at it in depth. Uh, I think you know, in three months or six months or however long it takes them to really incorporate it, NGRX will probably be simpler to use and write for a lot of, uh, lot of cases. Um, so I would take a look at that. They also had something that called NGRX Entities, which is <clears throat> already built into NGRX. So between data and entities, it'll be a lot simpler. Something of note that didn't actually 
there were no talks about it. But something to be aware of is a competitor called NGXS. And unfortunately, it you know almost all the same letters for character name. It's, it's kind of bad that the naming there could be naming confusion. But it is created by someone else who is a fairly big name in the Angular community. Uh, he didn't like some of the approaches of a NGRX, so he went with a different approach that uses annotations instead of pure functions. Like, it has a different approach. He's thrown it out there. Um, he released it after the call for propo proposals was uh, closed for NGRX, so there were no actual papers on it. But the community overall is paying a lot of attention to it, and he's promoting it pretty uh, strongly already. So. Um, if you don't like NGRX, there's this strong competitor that is getting a lot of attention called NGXS that you might want to look at. I would guess that in a year, maybe both of them will be pretty popular. I would think that as NGRX data is brought in and other things, that using NGRX will be simpler. It might be that they kind of uh, coalesce, uh, you know, have some sort of convergent evolution, or it could be replaced by something completely different. Who knows? I just wanted to add to what he was saying about NGRX data, because when I saw that presentation, I was a little confused, because um, I was at Angular Mix in October, and they presented NGRX entities as the next new thing. Um, but um, just from reading the website for NGRX data, it's actually built on top of NGRX entities. And the whole idea with entities was, um, you know, you're, a lot of times you're managing these kind of collections of you know, domain objects like customer or order or something like that. And that's kind of the same stuff you're doing all the time. And so NGRX Entities added some abilities to manage collections of that kind of data. Um, and NGRX Data is built on top of that. The names are a little confusing here. Um, and it basically, it builds on top of NGRX Entities to just add a layer of abstraction to do common operations for you. Um, and if you look at the documentation, it feels more like using something like um, Hibernate or something like that. Sorry, I'm a Java developer. But um, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, it's just sort of like, OK, I need uh, orders. So order service, get all, and it gives it to you. Or order service, add, and pff, it goes. And then all the indirect stuff is sort of taken care of for you. Um, a different presentation in the indirect track was um, kind of went the opposite direction where they were showing new schematics that are being added um, to the CLI to kind of generate all those files for you that people consider to be boilerplate, though the NGRX guys would argue with that definition. But um, like generating, you know, okay, I have an order. Here's like my reducer. Here's my action. Here's my this, the, okay. But um, the NGRX data is sort of taking the opposite approach of saying what we need isn't more code generation. We need um, something that really makes it so you don't actually need all that code. And so it's just kind of doing the common operations for you. And it's doing it in like kind of an object-oriented way, actually, which is funny because that's also what NGXS is kind of trying to do, is adding decorators to classes, and that's their argument. But then NGX data is also doing the same thing, doing more with decorators and classes and object inheritance and getting away from the more functional uh, approach. So it's just interesting. You want to add anything? Uh, no, I'll hand it off to Paul. I want to hear his opinion. <laughs> Yeah, so like what we were just hearing was that, oh, so there's now all these approaches for like, not only do you have NGRX to deal with your state, but now we're having like libraries and alternatives to deal with NGRX. Uh, and that, that was a pain that we had felt early on and kind of as part of the hallway track, I went down and tracked down the NGRX uh, crew themselves and had a, <clears throat> had a discussion with them about kind of like, you know, where they see the future of NGRX going as a whole. And there, there was this understanding that like, as people get more proficient with Angular itself, it actually reduces the number of use cases that people are finding for NGRX. Now, there are some solid use cases that will likely never go away with NGRX or, or the need for something like it, uh, but they would like to, to think about how to kind of shift NGRX into a role that it, rather than kind of re requiring you to take your data out of like the, the natural pre-existing data flow techniques that already exist in Angular, that rather they, they work with those existing techniques to kind of find a way to support what's already there in a centralized way, rather than forcing you to like hand, hand carry data from your you know route driven data loading back into your state or you know your observable data flow and carrying that out of that, putting it into state and then grabbing it back out again. Um, 
And so it'd be interesting to hear kind of like what's next from the NGRX team uh, to solve that kind of problem and to go along with the theme of making it more approachable and easier to use rather than let's just heap more on top of it. What was the name of the tool that makes boilers high code for reducers? So there's NGRX entity is inside the NGRX organization already. There's NGRX data which is on its way to be inside because the people who wrote it have been accepted into the organization. But NGRX-data, if you search for that, you'll find what you want. And then also go back to the schematics. The yeah, and schematics is a, is a code gen thing, yeah. Schematics. Yeah, yeah. So I actually had a bit of a commentary to add on, on NGRX, which is that, uh, uh, like, I feel like we're gradually reinventing a database in NGRX. And uh, I think we actually know where the story goes. We end up with like some sort of event sourced, observable, relational, queryable database at the heart of our application eventually. And I, I think that I can kind of predict what talks will be out uh, in ng-conf for two from now. It will be about that stuff. So next question. I can add something. Yep. Uh, yeah, kind of adding to the reinventing the wheel. Uh, the company I'm working at right now, uh, Vintage Software, about a year ago we kind of hit that point, we we use NGRX and we added like a abstraction layer on top that actually handles like relations between the entities. Um, so we're actually, because of like an NGRX entity, um, handling some of that boilerplate, we're abstracting that even higher to where our library is just the relationship uh, aspect of it and then everything else handled uh, third party. So I, I kind of see in the next year or two, we're going to see these higher, higher abstractions, and then people are going to look for things like relations between these entities, those, uh, those abstractions. Yeah. Uh, another question for our panel. <laughs> NGConf related in some way. Yeah. What do you think about um, video elements? We have a few demos over there. Uh, I love it. Who wants to talk about elements? Uh, I'm excited for it. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping kind of the roadmap is eventually I'll be able to stamp out some of my Angular components into web components or custom elements um, that I can use in some other projects. Um, seems like the current iteration is not quite there yet, um, but it's in the long-term roadmap. Yeah, so um, let me re kind of reset what we're talking about here. Uh, so Angular elements, it's a... Uh, an approach that you can use with Angular, it's still in progress, it's not actually out and available yet. I think you can get like a preview version and give it a try, but it, it's still really rough. It's the idea that you'd be able to package up a reusable component as a standalone um, web component that you could then plug into some other application, Angular or otherwise. Uh, until very recently, this approach hasn't really had much traction because the footprint of Angular itself to be able to like get this going and have it not be an absolutely huge payload size, um, it's just been it's been too large and the tooling hasn't been there. But also as part of the conference and some of the talks, they talked about the actual payload size of an Angular application using their brand new renderer is now down to 2.2K. Uh, so they're now at a point to where they can like ship Angular inside of a component, and that makes this approach much more uh, tractable. And because it's under 10K, we all got cake. Yeah. And so uh, these gentlemen are actually slightly obsolete because in the hours immediately after that talk, they made a further tweak and got that same hello world down under 1K. Oh, wow. Under 1K. So Angular will soon be the reigning leader of small hello worlds. Um, okay. so. Before we use up the other ha the second half of our lunch, I want anyone who has an experience from ng-conf they want to share who's in our audience here, which is more people not on the camera than are on the camera, uh, I'd like to invite you to step up for a moment and give your 30-second experience if you, if you have one. I'm not going to demand Bill do it, but anyone who wants to. Okay, next question. Or next volunteer to give a, give a story. A yeah, go ahead. So, uh, you guys were talking about how was the main focus was on improving quality of life. So what quality of life improvement are you most excited about? Quality of life or tooling? 
Um, probably ng update. Um, so the new feature in the Angular CLI. Um, so the idea with a lot of the improvements of the Angular CLI in this next uh, major release is the tooling. So making it easier to adopt new changes coming down uh, from Angular. Um, so the ng update was, I think, a big one that they focused on. So I typed a simple command. It updates my packages uh, to the latest version of Angular, but also does code transformation. So Typically, if there's a breaking API change, I have to go find all the references to that change and fix them. Um, but with ng-update, I believe they leverage schematics to make those changes, um, and they just automatically change your code for you. Um, so making these updates a lot quicker is kind of what I'm excited about. Yeah, I actually want to expand what Corey was saying. So that ng-update, it's not actually, uh, it's, it's created in a generic way. So yes, you can use ng-update update, not great, ng update to say, I want to move to the latest version of Angular. But if you actually maintain your own third party libraries in such a way that you add the correct schematics, you can actually tool additional third party things to say, ng update Angular material, ng update my third party grid component, ng update, et cetera, et cetera. And not only will it up bump the latest version in your package, but if the component author has uh, authored the schematics properly, it'll also be able to do the code transformations Corey described to your code to make sure you're now using the latest and greatest in that library as well. And in addition to update, the CLI in general has a lot of nice stuff coming to it, um, such as uh, ng add, the idea that I want to add Angular material to my application. Again, they've tooled it in a generic way that the Angular Material team authors schematics that automatically know how to modify your code to bootstrap up the use of Angular Material. So it imports the right modules for you, it downloads the correct dependencies, it, um, it sets up the, your index with the you know, reference to a CDN or reference to the right CSS script, makes all your imports for you. So it's uh, adding that generic tooling, I think, is actually really, really exciting to me. Okay, more questions, more topics. I'll make something up if I have to, but I want it from the audience, yeah. In the keynote, they referenced uh, some uh, tooling for building libraries. Um, they didn't really go into it, but I know this week, I was wondering why somebody didn't really mention that. Okay, the question from somebody too far from the microphone. Oh, sorry. But, no, that's fine, I'll just restate it. Uh, he mentioned that uh, there, there was something in the keynote about new ease of creating libraries. Yeah, so, about yeah. I know about that, but I'm supposed to be moderating. So who else knows about that? OK, so I used the tool they're talking about, but I forgot the name of it. What's is ng Packager. Yeah. yeah. So that there's an open source community-driven project called ng Packager. Um, it's been around for a little while. Um, it's a really useful command line tool to just package up components. It spits out all the different types of bundles you could possibly want to make it easy for users to uh, download and install either your package. Um, but until recently, that was kind of a standalone thing. It wasn't really integrated closely with the Angular CLI. Uh, this next version of the Angular CLI, they've kind of reworked a lot of the plumbing internally with the CLI. So they can plug um, different kind of tools into the CLI very easily, one of those being ng Packager. So with the next version of Angular CLI, you can very easily create an Angular library inside the Angular CLI with Angular CLI commands side by side with other Angular CLI projects, um, which will make it much easier to generate reusable component libraries. And by next version, I'm guessing seven-ish? Uh, version six. Like very shortly. Yeah, so they're on 1.7? They're on 1.7, but um, yeah, they're bump six just shipped. So we yeah. expect Angular 6 will be shortly behind it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think. Angular 6 will be released whenever the last few issues on the CLI are closed. Um, they have a milestone open. There's a handful of issues they're trying to get wrapped up, and then it'll probably be released shortly after. Um, another th thought that just came to me, they also announced that they're um, going to, like, once again, try and, like, version lock all the things together. So your CLI is going to be on 6, your Angular material is going to be on 6, all of the at Angular things, they're all going to, like, version bump them together to be all locked on 6, so. But that does not include RxJS, right. which Ben said is just coincidentally on 6, and he's not making any promises, it's going to stay locked. Right.
Okay, more questions of any kind. I don't want to have to make them up myself. Something, anything. Yeah, go. What was the best swag at NG Comp? What was the best swag at NG Comp? There's only one good answer if you work at Oasis Digital. Here you go. Anyone? Anyone? I'm, everyone's got a. Flashy green and blue balls. I think there's. Does anybody have I think there's some back there. All right. <laughs> Toss me a flashing ball. I do want you to do it. <laughs> okay, this was the best swag at NG Comp. Next. <laughs> no, no, no. He said next. Well. <laughs> All right. So uh, one thing, it's related to swag, but it's also kind of uh, just how the conference overall is. If you haven't been to NGConf, you've missed a very fun, goofy, um, yeah, I, I like it, conference. Other people, I think, might just think it's just too much. But they try to be really quirky, really engaging, really fun. So there's a lot of different things going on. The theme this year was Ready Player One. And so a lot of the things were uh, actually 80s themed all throughout. So we get, we're able to pick up little buttons to put on our lanyard that had you know, you know, facts of life or the Transformers or whatever. Um, there were a lot of the talks would have themes, you know, uh, Back to the Future or whatever. They have some of the other fun things they do, like they have an escape bus that you can sign up as a team and do. Like, so a lot of things that aren't really Angular related, but community building. One that I enjoyed, uh, I didn't actually participate in it, but I still enjoyed it, uh, was they had a competition going on for the three days of the of the conference. They had a quest, and you would solve puzzles. And it was kind of like from Ready Player One that you were solving puzzles. And so there'd be movie-related things and video game things. And one of the things was Rubik's Cube. If you solved a particular thing, you could get a Rubik's Cube from one of the vendors. And if you solved it, then you'd go back to them, and you'd get to go on to the next step. I wasn't there the third day. I didn't care about the quest. I didn't know how to do it. I love doing Rubik's Cube. So I was actually just walking around saying, you look lost. Can I do your Rubik's Cube for you? Um, and so I ended up grabbing one at the end, and, and Jerome grabbed one as well. So for me, having an NG Comp branded uh, Rubik's Cube is the best swag. But that's just because that is my personal style of dorkiness. Next question. Yeah. So I was surprised to see that um, NX, that um, build tool built on top of the CLI, uh, received so much attention. Um, do you see this kind of tool being used uh, by some, you know, uh, some companies out there that are not? So we're using it at Oasis Digital. So I know at least a few people here can talk about it a little bit. Is anybody up front, or do I have to go back to the back? Do you use who, who uses it? Who are you pointing at? Jack. Yeah. Jack. Oh, yeah. See, you need to wear the matching color because you're like invisible in the black. Well, I'm matching Paul. Yeah. So yeah. wave at the camera. This is Jack. So hi. So I wasn't at ngconf, uh, but I do use NX. So um, it's really useful for you know coordinating a bunch of related Angular projects together. Um, my understanding, though, is that a lot of, oh, to the camera, OK. Well, I want to answer his question, okay. right? So my understanding, though, is that uh, the Angular CLI has a lot of new features coming out that are going to kind of obviate it a little bit. So I'm interested to see kind of where it goes from here. Um, so that that definitely be something to watch out for in the future. And maybe somebody who is at the conference can speak to speak to that, like what they were planning. I don't know if you guys talked to them. He's oh, okay. Yeah. Next answer. Since I used to work with Jerome, and I, um, so um, without something like Index or the new features of the CLI that are coming, if you want to share code between multiple projects, it becomes very painful. And so if you have, say, five different libraries, you have to push those to NPM or a private thing like Artifactory. And so you're sitting there and you have, you know, like 10 different 
projects open because you have four clients and then three libraries are shared by some of them and you're like, I need to change this one little line in the library. So you do it, you build it, you push it, and then something's, you forgot something, and you have to go back through this whole process again, and then you gotta recompile all your clients, make sure they still work, and you're trying to figure out how to do Simver so everything doesn't break whenever you push something, and it's a huge, awful nightmare, which I know Jerome is familiar with. <laughs> So um, something like NX or the new features try to make that um, better um, by kind of having you put all your code sort of in one big project kind of with sub projects and having it work a little more directly um, as you're building. So as you change code in the libraries, you can automatically, um, you can access it directly without going through an internal NPM server. Well, another interesting thing I saw in NX was that um, they, they have special build targets as well so that you can say, okay, I made this change in one of my 10 libraries. Um, I have you know any number of clients. Some of them depend on this, some of them don't. Um, just go rebuild the things that are actually affected by this library and it supposedly can figure that out. Not actually tried it, but that's what they're saying. So that's kind of interesting to be like, okay, the tooling knows which clients depend on it. Go rebuild those and make sure that they're not broken by the new change. So that seemed interesting to me. Yeah, so like, should you use NX or some tool that like that? Yes, almost certainly. Um, however, with the CLI kind of producing its version of the like multiple project residency kind of idea, um, I'm personally I'm not a fan of tools that will overly prescribe you down a particular path, and that's a little bit how I feel about NX. Like it automatically comes in and like assumes you're using NGRX and assumes a bunch of things about you know what's best for your project, not just enabling you to do things. And so I, I will tend to look for things more like what's in the box with the CLI to get that same thing done and then kind of like forge my own opinions on top of that. So like I, in, NX in my opinion is just a little too opinionated in a lot of situations, but Yes, absolutely use a tool like that if you're looking at needing to share code across projects. Say it in the microphone. If you stand where I am and look at that, they'll be able to see you say it. Uh, the, big, the big force behind NX is uh, the schematics. They're just taking really good advantage of the schematics, right? So uh, what? There, I'm surprised there's not been more libraries in that area, but uh, have you guys seen other stuff? Um, done with the schematics, uh, I kind of imagine like automatic CMS creation and stuff like that where you have a feature you want to enable so you automatically build a form for those features um, for admin purposes and stuff like that. So schematics and they're how widespread are they used? How, how widespread of use do we expect? Anyone with an input? I haven't seen much yet, so, uh, but I might have been looking for it. Yeah, so I, I know this much about it, which is that they're working hard to enable schematics right now, and then next they'll be looking to encourage mass community use. Does anybody in the audience have any more to add to help with this question? Bill, you're very knowledgeable. Um, uh, just to echo what you were saying, the the work right now is mostly internal to the CLI uh, to get all of the features that we've kind of gotten used to in the CLI now based on top of schematics. So instead of just being the old blueprint style of doing things so you could generate a component or generate a service or a module, uh, it's not going to be using schematics to do all that, along with a lot of the other work that the CLI is now going to be doing. Like I'm pretty sure that the, the new ng add stuff is going to be heavily based around the way the schematics work. Um, I've been asking the CLI team about things like refactoring schematics. So in the same way that being able to use uh, the update command will take your project from one version to, to the next. I want to be able to do things like I'd like to move a component from one module to another. Or I'd like to rename a component or I'd like to destroy a component, which is a, one of my favorite features of the CLI they took away from me. I want to be able to, uh, to do all those things and schematics will enable all of that. So that is most of that action is happening inside of the CLI at the moment, um, but there's already a lot of uh, uh, of chatter about enabling library authors, like Paul was saying, to to do the same thing for their own libraries. The other exciting thing to keep in mind is that schematics, even though we're hearing about them mostly from the CLI perspective, they're not actually Angular specific. 
Um, it's uh, schematics have been specifically designed to let you use them away from the Angular CLI. Um, so they may turn out to be a very strong uh, code manipulation, code generation um, tool completely apart from Angular itself. Um, so I expect there's going to be uh, an explosion of activity once the Angular CLI itself kind of has its own handle on schematics. Beyond that, um, you know, coming soon, I think. So I'm going to do a thing that I've heard uh, members of the Angular core team do. And what was your name who asked the question? Nathan. So you, what you were specifically hoping for was like uh, schematics that would let you like make an admin portion of your application and like fill out screens for editing and that kind of thing? Yeah, kind of. If you right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage you to create that and release it. So. <laughs> next, next question. Anything else? I'll say something. Well, I had a question to throw out to, but go ahead. You guys choose it. Uh, just a different topic, something I wanted to mention. You might have noticed we haven't actually mentioned AngularJS at all. And that's pretty much how the conference was. Neither did anyone else. <laughs> yeah. In, in, the, uh, in the opening keynote, there was just a slide about, yep, we'll, you know, we'll do some security fixes and there was one workshop on how to you know how to convert from uh, angular js to angular and that was really it so um you know Sam the future Julian is angular up, what's that Sam Julian that's true uh sam julian is a, a friend of several of us who is a developer in the portland area and he has a tool who uh a video series online with a step-by-step -step on how to convert an angular js application to angular upgrade I, I unfortunately i don't remember the url off the top of my head uh he got a shout out but really that was it just one workshop on get off that get onto the new thing and two quick mentions about yeah this is done and you need to get off that and get onto the new thing other than that angular js is really in the rearview mirror so uh, uh a, a, a phrase i heard go by earlier was the phrase hallway track and those of us who've been going to conferences for a long time know what the hallway track is Does anybody want to talk about the hallway track in case there's anybody here who doesn't know what on earth we're talking about <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so hallway track, that, that's where instead of going into the talks, you intentionally hang out in the hallway to hang out with all the other people who are not in the talks. And you get a chance to meet with people one-on-one -on -one and, and have generally your, your deeper, uh, you know, your longer lasting uh, relationships, those actually form there in the hallway where you're able to like, you know, talk one-on-one -on -one and, and kind of say, hey, here, here's some problems I've been having. What have you done to solve this? And you know, kind of relationships form out of that. And so, yeah, there's, of course, every year at NGConf, it's a lot of great chances to do that. Um, day two is kind of like loosely structured around the idea. There's a lot of little micro talks and, and a lot of uh, <clears throat> like workshop panel like situations where you like go in with, with a small group and just have these uh, like one on one Q&A sessions with a lot of the team members. So, yeah, that, that was great this year as always. Yeah, um, to add to that, kind of one of the big reasons I go to the conference is that second day. Um, they have expert panels just running nonstop all day. We'll have uh, four or five of the speakers um, basically throw them in a room and give them a random topic. And you can go in there, and usually it's a pretty small room, pretty small group, maybe 10 to 20 people at most. And uh, unfortunately, those discussions aren't recorded, but those are some of my favorite discussions because you can ask them directly. Uh, questions and get really deep topics um, out of those things. So that's definitely what I recommend going to the conference for. Next question. Anything ng-conf related? I'll have to make something else myself. So uh, the counterpoint to the hallway track is that all of the content from the conference is published online on you isn't it all already on YouTube, yeah. right? Yeah. And you can actually consume it more efficiently on YouTube than you can live because you can you can turn that speed meter up past one to one point two five or one point five. So keeping that in mind, like all the technical content is in fact free three days later. Uh, what's everybody's thoughts on like why did you find it worthwhile, like getting on a plane and showing up? I mean, we've heard about the holiday track, but beyond that. 
Uh, I mean, a lot of it is the hallway track. Um, but yeah, in, in the individual talks themselves, like the one that um, comes to mind as one that is useful was by Ward Bell and a guy, Xander, I don't remember his last name, where they taught um, uh, observables in RxJS. And um, there wasn't much of the content that was useful to me as a developer, but as an instructor, I found it useful just to see how other people are teaching these concepts that are not particularly easy to teach. Uh, so I'm going to watch that video a few more times to try to become better as an instructor to just see how they uh, did things. Um, the other perspective that in answering the question is this is my third Angular conference. I went to ng-conf last year. I went to ng-atlanta earlier this year. and. Uh, it was like three was a magic number. I finally felt like when I walked in the room, I knew people. Like I now really feel tied into the Angular community. I'm not a big name. You know, if you put me on a podcast, no one outside of St. Louis and really most people in St. Louis would have no idea who I am. But you know, some of the speakers, some of the organizers, like I see them, they're like, hey, how you doing? Like I, I am starting to become friends on this level. So now I know like, you know, Sam Julian, this, uh, the guy who wrote the definitive guide for upgrading from AngularJS. If I have a problem with that, I can personally reach out to the person that is the one of the leading experts on that. Similar people in other areas. So it's, it's really building those connections. Um, I know some people who are have been with our company longer. We're working more on the you know company networking level, but for me, it was more uh, personal networking. Yeah, I, I mean, my ticket paid for itself because I got to follow on Eric and, and Albert for three days, and you know, stalk them and figure, pick their brain about as much stack split stuff as I possibly could. So that was well worth going out, in my opinion. Uh, free swag. <laughs> I think like that both of these. There, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, but I overpacked and have like 10 new t-shirts, so. Um, but uh, yeah, kind of to reiterate what Lance said, it's a lot of community. Um, just being able to go and ask people questions, um, going to a conference and being able to just ask the expert or the person that wrote that library uh, their opinion or help or um, just getting guidance of where I should go looking uh, is really valuable. So. Yeah, I don't have much to add, but yeah, meeting people and kind of feeling like you have more of a context to everything that's going on. That's nice. For the for the for the to wrap up, because with the ending time, I've been waiting for Bill here. I'm hoping he'll like step the raise on camera to give his impressions. So, Bill, you have the last <laughs> word. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to step up, but I will give the the no pressure. Last word. Um, it's really going to echo a lot of what we what we just heard. Um, we had a really great moment at the Oasis Digital Angular Bootcamp booth. Uh, Brad Green, the head of the Angular team, actually came over to the booth. Uh, I think he'd seen the hoodies. So, um, Paul, if you want to show what the hoodies look like from the back, there's the Angular Bootcamp logo, and then the "You Can Teach with Us." And anybody who's been around the Angular community for very long knows that Brad Green, the head of the Angular team, is always wearing this, this dark gray, this black t-shirt that says, you can sit with us on it. And it's his way of saying, the Angular team, uh, sure, they're, they're geniuses, but they're not gods. They are you. You are able to be part of the Angular community. You're able to contribute just the way that they can. Um, they want this to be an amazingly open and welcoming uh, community. I've been part of a lot of open source communities over the years, and I can tell you, you don't take the non-toxic nature of the Angular community for granted. It is really special. So when Brad came to the booth, one of the things I told him, I said, I'm going to embarrass you, I, I apologize, but the, the reason that we're, you know, that we have this homage to your you can sit with us on the back of these hoodies is because we really do appreciate the nature of the Angular community. Um, I go to these conferences anymore because it's filled with my friends. I genuinely love these people and I get to see them there. And it's not just about, uh, you know, context or asking a question or being able to talk to a library author. It's all those things. Absolutely all those things. Those things are super valuable. But I go because I miss these folks and I really, really love them and I get a chance to see them. So I told Brad, we're going to uh, going to embarrass you a little bit. Um, the Angular technology is fantastic. The Angular community is even better than the technology. And I told him, I think that flows directly from him. In, in large part, 
he, Mishko, Igor, the other members of the Angular team, they care so much about not just doing a good job with the technology, but doing an incredible job taking care of the community and honoring all of us with the, with the attitude and the, the perspective that they, that they bring to it. Um, and you really, really feel that in person. You get a lot online, but a lot of times the anonymity, the, you know, the sitting behind a keyboard, it's hard to feel empathy for another person. In person, you get all of that. And NGConf is a, a fantastic place for that to happen. Um, so that's why I go. Yeah, I can get everything on YouTube. I can get all the technical content on YouTube. I can even get a lot of that context, a lot of the structure, you know, background, things like that. But I don't get to hang out with my friends in the Gibson Girl Lounge until 2 o'clock in the morning anywhere but in person. And that's why I go. Thanks for coming, everybody. You're welcome to hang out and chat for a little bit. But this is the end of the recording, end of the program.